Let's review some of what we covered. Relational evangelism is long-term, slower communication with people you have likely future contact with. Stranger evangelism is more direct, short-term communication with people whom you have no probable future contact with. With relational evangelism, I can especially show gentleness, patience, and long-suffering. With stranger evangelism, I can especially show the seriousness and urgency of the gospel. It is an opportunity to exercise courage with direct speech. This class will give you tools for relational evangelism, but I especially have stranger evangelism in mind in these lessons. We also talked about the definition of evangelism itself. Evangelism, strictly speaking, is verbally communicating the good news of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ with the call to repentance and faith for the forgiveness of sins and the receiving of eternal life. More generally speaking, by evangelism, we can also refer to the activity or communication we engage in with the goal of sharing the gospel. It's what we do to start or carry a conversation where we can share the gospel. The work of evangelism includes the work of seeking out opportunities to share the good news. Sometimes evangelism falls right into your lap. How many of you have ever had an opportunity to share the gospel with someone that has unmistakably been given to you on a platter? Just <clears throat> In that case, we are to be, quote, prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason, for the hope that is in you. That's what Peter says. But I would like to convince you not to merely wait to be asked for the hope that is in you, but to work at initiating gospel conversations. Evangelism takes work. As Mark Cahill says, evangelism is a work that you can't do in heaven. Jesus says, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. And Paul writes, if I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. And he says elsewhere, Paul, he who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive wages, his wages, according to his what? To his labor, yeah. Again, evangelism is a work. It's worth doing intentionally, and it's a labor worth doing on purpose. We read it last week, but I'd like to read it aloud again from John 4, verse 35. I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are ripe for har- are, I keep saying ripe, are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap for that which you did not labor. Others have what? Have labored. And you have entered into their labor. Note four things from this passage. Evangelism is labor. It takes work. Evangelism involves sowing and reaping. A large harvest is disproportionately produced from sowing something small, that is, the seed of words. Evangelism is a community project. One labors, and another enters into that labor. One sows, and another reaps. And evangelism is a recipe for shared joy. Jesus says, sower and reaper rejoice together over harvest. As evangelism is a labor, I would like to say something about initiating conversations on purpose. It is a freeing thing to do deliberate, unrestricted evangelism. Many of you have jobs throughout the day where you are on someone else's property, working for someone else's business. Can someone get a a, a chair for our sister? Many of you are work jobs throughout the day where you are on someone else's property, working for someone else's business, and operating under someone else's rules. 
talking about things that might prick, that might especially prick the conscience of those around you, might be disruptive to the work that you have agreed to do. Not all arrangements are conducive to having unrestrained gospel conversations. And I know some of you are aching to have them. While we were on the street one evening, my friend Rich Sanford marveled at how liberating it is to set aside time to do uninhibited, unbridled evangelism, to seek out a fishing hole, to take advantage of the freedom to do straightforward and unabashed evangelism might be exactly what the doctor ordered to give full expression to the God-given longing you have to clearly share the gospel. One need not be casual about this. It is not spiritual to only passively wait for opportunities to come to you. As Jesus said, it's the shortest quote you'll get from me of Jesus. As Jesus said, go. You have freedom in Christ to be deliberate and resolute about generating opportunities to have gospel conversations. And God remains fully sovereign in this. As you work, God is at work in you, both to will and to act according to his good pleasure. He gets all the credit. Paul says in Colossians 1.29, I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. It's not a zero-sum game. You are God's workmanship, Paul writes. You are created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. And Paul prays for the Thessalonians. May God fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power. I sometimes hear young men spiritualize a passive approach to finding a wife or developing a career to provide for a future family. As though trusting God meant merely waiting for an opportunity to show up. I'd like to prod them with the language of active and intentional pursuit. Go and put yourself on a path conducive to finding a spouse or getting a better job. Look and watch and train and prepare and hunt. Work at it. Don't be shy about it. Put your hand to the plow. Go find a wife. And then say, I have obtained favor from the Lord. In the same vein, we do not need to spiritualize a passive approach to evangelism. Just as a fisherman can research a lake, we can look out for a good evangelism fishing hole. We can look for good opportunities and even seek to create them. You know Miss Judy? Do you know Miss Judy? She's at FCC here. She likes to talk with people at the local pool. She tells conversations about she has in the hot tub. <laughs> I talked to a brother, Joe, this week, who volunteers at a hotel for refugees, just so he could share the gospel. Yesterday, I spoke with a brother named Will, who gets conversational with the other parents of his son's soccer games. My friend Rich, when he moved to his neighborhood, he made it a goal to have dinner with every person on the street and share the gospel with them. And I know some ladies who have made it a point to connect with other neighborhood moms at the local playground. One of the first things I did in Utah is go sit on a bench at a local, state, at a local skate park. One thing that will serve you well in developing a habit, one thing that will serve you well is developing a habit of greeting strangers and speaking with them, even when it's not evangelistic. Practice asking people their names and get to know more about them. Do not, do not let your introverted personality have the last word here. And don't chalk this kind of thing up to being extroverted. To be hospitable and approachable and warm and curious is a Christian virtue. Paul even makes hospitality a qualification for elders. I think we have one more chair right here. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, if you greet only your brothers, what more are you than these others that he was comparing? 
Here's my practical tip for today. Develop personal terminology for greeting others that is especially warm and familial to other believers and kind and welcoming to strangers. You might address your neighbor in a cheerful way with, hey, neighbor, or even with a preemptive, hey, friends, and draw from a ready-made list of open-ended questions. What brings you here today? With someone more regular, you might ask, what did you do this weekend? That is a question which, if reciprocated, if they ask it in turn to you, opens the door for you to talk about what you did on the Lord's Day. Another open-ended prompt you might have heard me use is, tell me more about yourself. And if you forget someone's name, please remind me of your name. Use it in a sentence afterwards. Instead of saying, I'm bad at remembering names, say, it takes me a few times. I need to practice that more. One question I enjoy asking is, what have you been thinking about? What has been on your mind? Or what kinds of books do you enjoy reading? Again, any open-ended question you can ask can potentially be reciprocated, aimed back at you. And that is to your advantage, both for getting to know each other and for opening the door to gospel conversations. You are not weird for talking to the person next to you. People are interesting. They're made in God's image. They're worth being curious about, be inquisitive. This active curiosity about the people you cross paths with is not only suitable for being cordial and social and sociable as a Christian, it will also serve you well in evangelism because it will generate more opportunities for you to have spiritual conversations. While, rest, while evangelism is a tremendous recipe for joy, it is not guaranteed to be pleasant, no matter how friendly you are. Here I'd like to give you some realistic expectations. Deliberate evangelism is like getting your car ready on a winter morning. Each night, another layer of ice or hard frost forms. More of it has to be broken and scraped away. It doesn't matter how warm your car was yesterday. Beginning a conversation, a gospel conversation, with a stranger can be unnerving, no matter how many times you've done it. You sweat, your heart races, your courage is tested, and you simply must break through the ice yet again. In other words, starting is often awkward. Waiting for it to feel smooth and natural spiritualizes inaction and passivity. If someone tries to sell you a method of evangelism that feels completely natural, it is false advertising. Better to swallow the common awkwardness of it and just get on with it. Courage is a common Christian virtue, but it is especially to be accentuated by men. And here I say to men, punch through the awkwardness. Sharing the gospel with strangers is an excellent way to grow in your boldness. And be willing to have your feelings hurt. Evangelism is emotionally and relationally risky. God meant for humans to be treated with courtesy and dignity and respect. But telling people about sin, righteousness, and judgment can bring out their inner golem. Evangelism is a sinner telling another sinner about his sin and how he can be forgiven. Jesus says, this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come into the light, lest his works should be exposed. No one is neutral to the gospel. It softens or hardens, depending on the work of the Spirit. Paul writes, We are the aroma of Christ to God among those being saved and among those who are perishing to one a fragrance from death to death and to other a fragrance from life to life. So it is received either like a perfume of life or the stench of death. In the next sentence, Paul says, who is sufficient for these things? Every person in the world ought to stop and listen to the gospel. If for no other reason than to be courteous to their neighbor and be curious about what they have to say. Not to mention to be eager for a solution for their shame and guilt before a holy God. But they aren't. 
People can be indifferent or even rude. So, be willing to be hurt, even relationally hurt. You may lose friends over this. Your family may not support you. I had ex-Mormon friends in Utah who were told by their parents, look, I get you going to an evangelical church. Why can't you just leave people alone? Why actively try to convince other people to join you? That's too far. Why actively try to convince other people that their religion is false? That's extreme. That's fanatical. It's caused tremendous friction in their family. Jesus says, I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be of his own household. He may be accused of being judgmental or closed-minded and your life may be evaluated more harshly by those seeking to find dirt on you. This kind of pushback and scrutiny can stir a person up to self-doubt. Do I really believe this? Am I really qualified to do this? Who am I? Here, you need to constantly revisit the gospel. There is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. David writes, Restore to me the joy of my salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways. Sinners will return to you. Being forgiven and having the gift of the Holy Spirit What a deal, by the way, the gospel, forgiveness, and the third person of the Trinity dwelling inside of you. Being forgiven and having the gift of the Holy Spirit is tremendously liberating. This empowers you to do emotionally and relationally risky things for the sake of the gospel. Evangelism is like a a beggar telling other beggars where to find bread but it's also like being an ambassador sent to tell others our king requires unconditional surrender. It's like a medic telling an injured person not to fall asleep or worse, being sent to a graveyard to tell everyone to wake up. Paul writes, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So evangelism involves a lot of rejection. People usually don't want to talk about religion. And people who do want to talk about it often don't have a passion for truth. Have you ever, have you ever noticed how worked up people get over politics? <laughs> and, and, and different to the, the, the foundations underneath politics or the things that are even bigger? The good conversations that do happen are encouraging in the short term and the joy of fruit and harvest are encouraging in the long term. We'll talk about that in a future week, the positive end or a a positive account of realistic expectations in light of the sovereignty of God. But if someone is advertising an evangelistic method that more or less guarantees acceptance, probably isn't Christ-like evangelism. Going into it with an expectation of rejection will free you up to keep at it. I mentioned last week that evangelists learn to be cheerful and easily pleased. We often pray for one good conversation. If we work for two hours at generating conversations and the Lord provides one, then huzzah! Praise the Lord! I'm flying through my notes. That's great. The following story probably... Uh, perhaps doesn't flow well with our material today, but I'd like to share a fresh evangelism story to encourage you. This is from this past Wednesday, I think. When I moved to Missouri, I spoke to some local Mormon missionaries and offered to buy them breakfast. We met downtown, and I shared the gospel with them. They regularly are transferred to different areas and pass along their contact info to those that replace them. So I was able to talk to their successors. I invited them to meet with me at the seminary bookstore. They agreed, and we had yet another conversation. Well, a week ago, I got another phone call from their successors. It was some female Mormon missionaries that were going down their list of contacts, sharing verses from the Book of Mormon. I offered to meet with them and to bring along my wife, so we met at the seminary bookstore. I asked them where they were from, 
they also asked us, I mean, it was forthright about our familiarity with Mormonism and our evangelism. We spoke fondly of Utah. By the way, I don't like stealth evangelism. And I don't like people not being honest about uh, what they already know or what their intent is. I don't want to be um, cunning. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, uh, we do not practice cunning, but by open statement of the truth, we commend, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of the Lord. That comes from 2 Corinthians 4. That might inform the kinds of tracks you use, even. Let's see here. I set the direction of the conversation by asking, what is most interesting and important about their beliefs. So I tried to get the conversation going by giving them the baton. Like, so tell me, and I'm, but I'm setting the direction. Uh, <clears throat> kind of getting through the pleasantries and getting to the most important things and asking them, what's most important about what you believe? And what are the most important differences between what you believe and historic Christianity? They answered in part that the Book of Mormon was a key difference. I then asked, this is maybe not important to our story, but just details. Didn't the Book of Mormon teach that God was always God and that there is only one God and that he has always been unchangeable? That's contrary, actually, to what modern Mormonism teaches. They also answered that we are spirit children of heavenly parents. They they believe that God has a wife. And then in the cult premortality, there's a begetting of spirit babies and that we pre-existed before coming to earth. I asked them whether they thought our spirit conception marked the beginning of our existence, that's Brigham Young's view, or whether we were eternal, was Joseph Smith's view, and then given a kind of upgrade, spirit body at spirit conception. Sorry, in the weeds here for a second. They didn't know, but they had been thinking about it. One of them quite enjoyed thinking about doctrine, so appreciated the question. I then shifted to describing the biblical view. And we'll talk about this in a future week, but this strategy I call supremacy evangelism. It's taking whatever someone has outside of Christ and showing how I have something infinitely better in Christ. The biblical worldview accounts for things with infinite more beauty and coherence. All matter has its own glory and beauty, and God is responsible for all glory and all beauty. All glory flows from him, and through him, and to him. So God gets the glory for the existence of matter. Why does that, why is that important? Mormonism teaches that matter is uncreated and eternal. Thus, God made all of the material we are, we are made of, and he gets the credit for that. Not only that, but God created our innermost self. So Stacy's on the left right here. Two la- uh, they call them sister missionaries in Mormonism. They're on the couch in front of us. And I'm just uh, responding to what they had explained, and I'm trying to give an account of the Christian view. Our very existence is <coughs> owing to God. God created us. He's not merely my father in the sense of giving me a kind of spirit body upgrade or shaping extant already existent matter. Rather, God is the father, the creator of the total and original self. All of me was fathered by God in the sense of being the creator. I am God's offspring in that sense. I'm borrowing Paul's language from Acts 17 at Areopagus where he quotes a pagan poem where he says, does it not say we are God's offspring? And he goes on to say, in him we live and move and have our being. I am entirely a creation of God. God is not merely a father to part of me, but all of me. And not only that, God is my adoptive father. He receives me at his front door. I come in with weak, spotty, incomplete, but genuine faith and repentance. And he gladly receives me. He forgives me. 
and he permanently binds me to himself. And he gives me the gift of the Spirit. And he bathes me. He puts me at his table. He feeds me. I am totally accepted and loved. I am his. Such believers in Christ can say, this comes from Romans 8, 15. And uh, the, one of the strategic reasons I'm using this verse is that they use the second part of it to argue that universally we're all begotten of a heavenly mother. <clears throat> And we're all spirit babies. We were all spirit babies. And we're all children of God in that sort of pagan sense. And so they use Romans 8.16, which says, the spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And they quote that all the time. So I'm just, I'm getting it in there before they can use it. <laughs> and I love, in other contexts, I've asked when they brought it up, would you say that verse is about universal sonship? Or do you think it's about specifically adopted sons who walk by the Spirit and who have received Christ. So, I just introduced the verse starting at 15. Quote, I, uh, We have not received a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but we have received the spirit of what? Adoption, Adoption. Adoption. yeah, sonship. By whom I cry, we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. At some point, we talked about uh, the Trinity, where it came up, and one of them excitedly opened up their King James Bible and showed us a hand-drawn chart explaining the Trinity that someone had taught them. Someone had explained the Trinity to them. It was written there, right there. Praise God. We were building on the efforts of an earlier Christian to explain sound doctrine, and it was clearly communicated. Ha! Amazing. The LDS missionaries, as Mormon missionaries, as I'm sure some of you have experienced, were quick to agree, so to speak, and celebrate, quote, shared beliefs and, quote, common doctrines. But we did not countenance this. The missionary sitting on the right said that Jesus was our creator and the creator of all. So they're very, very uh, quick to throw out language like that. But when you press a bit, you learn they don't think Jesus created everything. <laughs> so my wife replied, hadn't you just said that there were some things Jesus didn't create? And what about us? If we are eternal, then how can you say Jesus is our creator? Then my wife explained that not that she explained that only God is eternal. Even time himself is created by God. By the way, neat way to spend time with your spouse. It doesn't happen often. I think you should come with me downtown once a year, but it puts an extra smirk on your face when you get to see your wife sharing the gospel with somebody. Else. Then my, uh, <clears throat> that's what makes God unique. We come from him. He created us and he created time itself. I then asked the missionaries, I'll pause here for a second. We'll talk about this in a future week. But there's a rubric you might consider. We can maybe write it down now if you have a pen. For the kinds of communication we get into in evangelism. Um, this is in no helpful order, but there's six types of communication I think are common to evangelism. Listening, where you pause, where you learn to let another person have the respect of sharing their own thoughts. Slowing down. If you're like me, you get too excited and you need to chill out. You need to show the courtesy and the humility and the patience of listening. Secondly, questioning. We'll talk about that in future week too. Learning to ask questions that draw people out, that help them participate in the conversation. Again, if you're anything like me, you monologue. So you can mitigate the monologuing by asking open-ended questions, pausing, and letting there be awkward silence. It's okay. Asking questions 
that draw things out and set a direction. Another one would be sharing. That's an aspect of communication where you offer something up for consideration. It's to the effect of, can I show you something? Or have you considered this? It's a gentler way of presenting, perhaps, the authority of God's word or an expression of truth. But if that's the only mode we restricted ourselves to, I don't think it would be faithful. So the fourth thing is declaring. Declaring takes a more assertive mode. It says, this is what God's word says. This isn't my perspective. So you stop couching things with preface of, well, what I think is, well, the way I see it is, well, I've always thought that that might have a role to play when you're sharing and you're being gentle and you're introducing a very heavy topic. But at some point, as Christians, we have to own the fact that we are ambassadors and our king did not send us as mere philosophers. He sent us as messengers. Amen. So you still might, you might not be street preaching as you declare, but you are being assertive, consistent with the authority of God's word. So we have listening and questioning, sharing and declaring, and the last two would be encouraging and correcting. Encouraging is to the effect of, Jesus said, you are not far from the kingdom. He said to that one man. Encouraging is acknowledging the work of God already at work in someone's life and fanning into flame something that perhaps is already there. And then correcting is warning and rebuking and reproving. And again, I, if, I, if I restrict my evangelism to only the easy parts of listening and questioning and sharing, uh, it can look pretty low-key, right? You can seem pretty peaceful. But a, a versatile evangelist or a versatile Christian doing the work of evangelism has to be willing to pivot to any one of those six. Correcting might look like, sir, you are arrogant and you need to repent. So back to our story. I asked the missionaries a question. What makes your God Worthy of worship. Why worship that God? What is it about your God that makes him uniquely fitting for worship? And just set it up. And I try to be, I know this is like life and death stuff. I'm trying to be friendly even as I share this. If you went to a family reunion of all the gods. <laughs> Again, Paul says, who is sufficient to talk about these things? And, the, and your God was at a table with his brothers and his spirit uncles. If you're not from Utah, it probably just sounds super strange. <laughs> and his exalted spirit ancestors. What would make your God uniquely worthy of worship? How is he different from the others? What about him is unique? They answered that their God wasn't in any competition with other gods, and that it wasn't a matter of comparison. That their God was their God. That's why they should worship him. So when I took them to Isaiah 43.10, and I did this by asking, can I show you a verse from the Bible? What of the six categories would that be? Sharing. May I offer something up for consideration? I haven't really pressed it yet. But it's neat because when you share God's word, it has its own authority. It is self-authenticating and self-evidencing. I said, can I show you a few Bible verses? I said, sure. And they've given me permission to do that. Right? It's very rarely some, rare someone will shoot you down in that context anyway. So Isaiah 43.10 says... Before me, there was no God formed, neither shall there be any after me. And when I do, when I show a Bible verse, 
often is I try to do a little bit of reading comprehension restatement. So, prior to God, no other gods were formed. And subsequent to God, there will never be another god formed. Let me show you two more. Back in Isaiah 40, verse 14, God says, Who has been my counselor? Who has taught me the path of justice? I think he says something like, Who, who held my hand along these things? No one has ever been God's tutor. No one has ever mentored God or taught God. And what I love about sharing these things is there's an intrinsic joy to it. It's not just a means to an end. The gospel of the glory of Jesus Christ and of the supremacy of the God of Israel is its own joy. Talking about that works you up. So it's a win-win. If they receive what you say, great. If they don't, you're better off for it. You've been stirred up by the very things you're sharing. I think at that point I explained, uh, you know, my mom taught me to play piano when I was a boy. Um, but I can't take credit for learning to play piano on my own. I'm not very good at it, but... Whatever Paul... Well, I'll continue the story. Then I show them Romans 11, verse 33 to 36. It says, Who has ever known the mind of the Lord? Or who has ever been his counselor? Who has ever given God a gift that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. So, Mormons, they can be pretty sensitive to forthright critique of the religion, but I'm here, I'm just, I am monologuing for this moment, but I'm thinking, so, think about it. God's the only God. He's never had any ancestors. He'll never have anyone subsequent to him. He's never had a tutor. Everything he has, he has in himself. And this was what makes Christians so eager to worship him. And if, uh, if, all things, if all things that God gives, he has in himself, they come from himself. God's not a... Oh, continue, sorry. No gods were formed prior to God. God has never had a tutor. And God gets glory precisely because he has never been given what he doesn't already have. This makes God very different from my earthly father. Again, this is a preemptive metaphor. Mormons are very eager to compare God to our own earthly father. So, with some experience here, I'm trying to work this metaphor in before they use it to explain God. Everything my earthly father has was given to him. Like Paul writes, we cannot boast as though what we have wasn't given to us. My earthly father isn't my God. He can only give me what he has received. He is a conduit of grace. God isn't like that. He gives what he has always had to give. And what he is, he has always been in himself. So I can honor my earthly father but I can worship God. They tried then to bring the conversation back to the notion of our common beliefs. They even said at one point, well, that's an interesting nuance. And then we stopped them and we said, uh, well, I think the fact that you see that as a nuance itself is a difference. When we catechize our children, it's like lesson four or five. How many gods are there? Are there more gods than one? <laughs> no, says the three-year-old. So when I remember explaining these things to my, my young son at the time, he was baffled by the notion that there was more than one God or that God himself hadn't always been God. So I explained, these are the things that fuel our prayer and our singing and our reading of scripture and our gathering and our worship of God. If we learned hypothetically that God wasn't the first God, that would be 
catastrophic. It would destroy our whole religion. It's not a nuance. So it was polite, but I told them, this is where I'm getting a bit assertive, even corrective. I said Mormonism is cynical. I said those three words. It, in essence, teaches that we can't know, that we can't have a relationship with the very first God, the one from whom all the truth and all beauty and all goodness comes from. And I explained, think about it. The greater the God, the greater the gift. The greater we see God to be, the more amazing the gift of salvation is. This is what makes Christmas so astounding. It's not that some finite God among many, downstream from other mentor deities, took a human body. No, it's that the very God that is infinite, who never learned, who has all power, who has no peers or superiors, it's this God, the Most High, who became a baby. Wow. God became a man. The infinite became finite. The never learned omniscient became a homeschooled Hebrew boy. The God who cannot be hurt became a suffering servant. This God became a man and he went to the cross. And he died for sinners. As Peter said, you killed the author of life and God raised him from the dead. And so I looked at these two sister missionaries and I said, if you trust this God and look to this Christ, you will have all your sins forgiven and you will have the immediate gift of the Holy Spirit and you will know the most high God. As I said, the greater the God, the greater the gift. At this point, I swear I saw the second missionary's eyes tear up. And by the way, we we evangelists get a little excited about what we think might be positive responses. So sometimes you can take a detail like that with a grain of salt because you never know. In their culture, they're very quick to tear up. But like I said, evangelists are optimistic and we're easily pleased. The first missionary replied that what I had just said was beautiful and that she didn't have much to say. So she then started to bear her testimony, so to speak, of knowing that the Mormon church was true. It was a pitiful fallback. We listened politely and I suddenly had to get going to their next appointment. I doubt that, but God bless them and forgive them. So they offered to pray to close. Would you mind if we said a prayer? I just, I, I countered with my own offer to pray. Offer to pray. Would you mind if I did? <laughs> I prayed that God would bring them Christian friends along the way and that they would come to know the Most High God and that God would establish their steps for the next season of life after their mission. <clears throat> 